If you have never heard of Luni Solar Calendar, then it's my pure pleasure to tell you about it today. I've spent many months studying this subject and I was skeptical just like you are right now. But at the end of the day, truth is truth and it must be told. There are over 100 verses that refer to this calendar, but in this video I will use only 10 of them and I believe that's more than I need. If there are over 100 verses that support this calendar, then how many more do you need to understand that God is the creator of our calendar and he also controls the time? These 10 verses that I mentioned come from 9 different books of the Bible so that you can see that this calendar is consistent from Genesis to Revelation and it does not change, just like our God. What we cannot say about our man-made pagan unbiblical calendar that has been manipulated multiple times and it's still far from perfect. Anyway, let me analyze our 10 verses. Our first verse is located at the very beginning of the Bible and talks about the basics. And God said, let there be lies in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Just from this verse alone, we can build an entire biblical calendar. As you can see, the sun and the moon have been created to be observed and used to count the time. So let's break it down. The job of the moon is to show us the length of the weeks and months. And the job of the sun is to show us the length of the days and years. So the main rule says observation over calculation. And even the Merriam-Webster dictionary states that a month is a measure of time corresponding nearly to the period of the moon's revolution and amounting to approximately 4 weeks or 30 days or 1 twelfth of a year. But let's go back to our verse. Generally, there are 7 biblical units of time. Number 7 is not a coincidence here. As I showed you before, the moon is for the weeks and months and the sun is for the days and years. And basically, that's all you need to count the time. How do I know this? Because God showed us the same pattern in the very beginning of the Holy Bible. Days and years are easy to understand, but signs and seasons need more explanation. The same Hebrew word for signs can be found in the next book and explains what exactly a sign is. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. As for seasons, some translate it as seasons of the year, but biblically speaking there are festivals that are based on the moon observation. To prove this, I will use another verse from our list where the same Hebrew word was used. He appointed the moon for seasons, the sun knoweth he's going down. Funny enough, the last book of the Bible also talks about the four units of time. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of man. So the first two verses helped us to pull out the basics, but the third verse will help us to build the calendar. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, said the Lord. This verse is an unfulfilled prophecy, and it talks about the future millennium of Jesus Christ. So the new moon is the first day of the month, and the Sabbath is always the seventh day of the week. Worship will take place from new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath. And to put it in a simple words, we will worship God every month and every week. So what else we will do in the millennium of Jesus Christ? Believe it or not, but you will keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Our next verse is again a beautiful unfulfilled prophecy. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And you guess it, this feast will be based on none else but this very calendar. Even in the time of Moses, this calendar was used to keep the same feast. Our fifth verse talks about the same festival but in a slightly different way. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. As you can see, everything fits perfectly. Can you apply the same verse to the Gregorian calendar? I don't think so. Now let's jump to the verse number 6 and see how it will work with our calendar. Now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month 
came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. Again, no confusion and no need for mental gymnastics, because this Creator's calendar is well synchronized with Bible verses. But you may ask, how do we know which one is the first day of the month? Well, our seventh verse can explain this quite well. Let me show you. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet, neither yesterday nor today? From this verse you can clearly see that the new moon is always the first day of the month. New moon was not an ordinary day, and we can find out more about this in our 8th verse. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon, in the time appointed, on the solemn feast day. This trumpet could also be heard on the full moon, which is here translated as time appointed. And according to some scholars, that was most likely the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, or Feast of Passover. So was there a big difference between the new moon and a Sabbath? Well, not really. Our ninth verse explained that both of these days were very important to our God. Thus said the Lord God, The gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened. Both new moon and Sabbath were special days on God's calendar, and any type of business activity were forbidden, which you can read more about from the book of Amos, chapter 8, verse 5. And finally, our last verse, which for some reasons is quite problematic and difficult to explain. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. I would like you to focus on the words marked in red. As you can see from the interliner Bible, they are correctly translated in KGV. But because these words don't fit the Gregorian calendar, some translators decided to change the meaning of this verse. And we can see that, for example, in the most corrupted Bible of our times, which is obviously NIV. But not only NIV got it wrong, so make sure that you have the correct Bible. So what exactly does the second Sabbath after the first mean? Biblical scholars have few theories that can explain this mysterious verse. The first Sabbath of the second month of the Jewish year. The first Sabbath after the second day of the Passover. The first Sabbath in the second year of the sabbatical cycle of seven years. The first Sabbath of the second half of the civil Jewish year. The second Sabbath of the Feast of Pentecost. As for me, I like to keep things simple, so in my humble opinion, second Sabbath after the first means second Sabbath after the first. But whatever this verse means doesn't change the fact that it can only be applied to God's calendar, and that's what matters here. So here you go, biblical calendar, made by God and craftily changed by man. But I'm not worried about this much, because there are over 100 verses that support this calendar and none that support Gregorian. Imagine that Vatican had never existed and they had never made this Gregorian calendar. What calendar would you follow then? The answer is God's calendar. Because this calendar existed from the beginning of the universe and it's still in use today by many countries with some modifications. Now what I would like you to do is to make a choice. Do you follow what God created or what man fabricated? Lunisolar calendar comes directly from the Bible, while Gregorian simply does not. Biblical calendar is based on moon and sun, but Gregorian calendar is only synchronized with the sun. Biblical month has 29 or 30 days, but Gregorian month can have up to 4 different lengths. Lunar month always starts from new moon while first day of the month in pagan calendar is based on nothing. Sabbaths on biblical calendar are based on moon phase, while non-working days on Gregorian calendar are based on paganism, traditions and Vatican doctrines. Majority of days and months on lunisolar calendar were numbered, while Gregorian calendar adopted names for all days and months which came from either pagan gods, festivals, emperors or names of the planets. All the seven biblical festivals are well synchronized with the lunisolar calendar, but on the Gregorian they cannot be tracked, so Vatican created their own fake happy days. 
And the last reason why you should reject Gregorian calendar is that this calendar will be completely destroyed in the millennium of Jesus Christ, while lunisolar will be restored.